Welcome back as we start Unit 6 about gases. You can see that in this unit, we are going to be dealing with things like the calculations associated with gases, but we need to introduce some concepts first. So this video is going to focus on defining gases and looking at the different variables that affect gases. Let's take a moment to define gases, and we're going to do that by comparing them to solids and liquids. Within a solid and a liquid, the particles are still being held together by forces. The individual particles like each other enough to hold them to somewhat of a form. It holds them close together. Within a gas, there's enough energy within those particles that they have, they have overcome those forces and they're able to move freely around their space. And that really changes the way that gases behave. Gases will expand to fill up whatever container that you put them in. So if you were to put just a few particles of a gas inside of a container, the attractions between those particles are relatively insignificant. They're not going to hold those particles together. And the particles particles are going to be able to spread out and take up the space inside the container. Most of us are fairly comfortable identifying a substance as either a solid, a liquid, or a gas. But in science, we want to apply some questions to that definition. And the questions that we use, does the substance have a constant volume? And does the substance have a constant shape? Consider a pencil, for example. I would identify a pencil as a solid. If I pick a pencil up and move it from one location to another, did the volume change? Did the amount of space that that pencil takes up change? No, it did not. So a pencil does have a constant volume. Did the shape change? When I picked the pencil up and moved it, the shape did not change. It remained constant. So a solid has a constant volume and a constant shape. Next, let's look at a sample of water, which I would identify as a liquid. Here I have 100 milliliters of water and it is inside of a graduated cylinder. So it has taken the shape of the graduated cylinder. If I take that 100 milliliters and transfer it into a volumetric flask, I still have 100 milliliters of water. The volume has remained constant. The amount of space that my sample takes up has remained the same. However, it has changed shape to fill its new container. So the shape is not constant. A liquid has a constant volume, but does not have a constant shape. Gases are really quite different. Gases are very compressible, meaning that you can squish them, you can squeeze them into tighter spaces. You can make them take up less space, or if you put them into a volume that where there's more space available, they will expand to fill that volume. Gases do not have a constant volume, and they do not have a constant shape. So this is one of the ways that we identify solids, liquids, and gases by asking ourselves, is the volume constant or is the shape constant? The next thing that we need to look at is some variables that affect gases. And these are the variables that are going to show up in some of the equations that we see in future videos. So the first variable is temperature. So what is temperature? Temperature measures the average kinetic energy of a substance. So if you've had a physics class before, you know that kinetic energy is measuring mass and velocity. We really want to focus in on that velocity portion. A temperature measurement is an indication of the speed of the particles. If you have warmer particles, they are moving faster than slower particles. If those particles slow down, the temperature is going to come down. So temperature is an indication of speed of particles. When we are studying gases, especially when we start doing calculations, temperature needs to be in units of Kelvin. 
Here is a quick reminder of where the Kelvin scale comes from. If you consider the Celsius scale, it is based on water, so the freezing point is at zero and the boiling point is at 100. I mentioned earlier that temperature is an indication of speed of particles. So there's a point where particles slow down so much that all motion stops. That point is called absolute zero and it occurs at negative 273 degrees Celsius. The Kelvin scale takes that point and shifts it up by 273 degrees so that absolute zero occurs at zero. The Kelvin scale has no negative numbers. Everything is just shifted up by 273 degrees. You can see that water freezes at 273 and boils at 373. For all of the gas law calculations that we're going to be doing, we want to work with the Kelvin scale. So if you are given a Celsius temperature, here is how you can convert that into a Kelvin temperature. You take your temperature in Celsius and you add 273 degrees. For example, if you are asked to convert 25 degrees Celsius into Kelvin, you would take the 25 degrees, add 273, and you would find that that is 298 Kelvin. Or if you saw a question that said, will water freeze at 250 Kelvin? We probably don't have the Kelvin freezing scale in our mind, so we could convert that to Celsius. You could do that by subtracting 273. So 250 Kelvin minus 273 is negative 23 degrees Celsius. Water freezes at zero degrees Celsius, so this water would freeze. So whenever you are working with temperature in some of the gas law problems that we're going to be seeing, you want to convert to Kelvin. Next, let's take a look at pressure. Pressure is defined as force divided by area. So force would be like a push or a pull, and that force is measured and then divided by the area of space where it is occurring. Atmospheric pressure is the pressure caused by the weight of air above us. So you've got gravity pulling air down, pulling our atmosphere down, and that exerts a force onto you and onto other things, and that is what causes atmospheric pressure. Now this is a primitive device that could be used to measure pressure, and I want to discuss it a little bit because it helps to explain some of the units that we see when we're measuring pressure. This is a very primitive barometer where you have a vat of mercury here and then this portion is exposed to the atmosphere while this is under a vacuum. So this portion of the barometer has nothing in it. As atmospheric pressure increases, it pushes down on the mercury. So that weight of air above us increases, it would push down on the mercury and force more of the mercury up the tube. And they would measure atmospheric pressure by measuring how high up the tube the mercury climbed. So one of the ways that we measure pressure, one of the units that we use, is millimeters of mercury. And this is a primitive version of how that would be measured. So they were actually measuring a length of how far up the tube it would, it would climb. So other units of measurement that we see when measuring pressure are atmospheres, kilopascals, and pounds per square inch. So these are some of the units of pressure that you're going to be seeing as you start working out problems involving pressure. Since this unit is directly involving gases, I want to talk a little bit more about the pressure of gas inside of a sealed container. If you have a sealed container with gas on the inside, then those particles are in constant random motion and those particles are colliding with the wall. They're colliding with the sides of the container. When that happens, every little collision exerts a force on the outside of that container. So that force on the outside of that container, that collision is what contributes or what causes the pressure inside that container. So the pressure in a sealed container comes from gas particles hitting the sides of the container.
This pressure can be increased two different ways. You can increase the number of particles in the container. By doing that, you're going to increase the number of collisions. More collisions is going to result in more pressure. The other way that you can increase this pressure is to increase the temperature of the particles. Because remember, temperature is related to speed of particles. So if you can cause these particles to move faster, you're going to have more collisions on the outside of that container and they're going to collide with more force. So there's two ways to increase the, the pressure inside this container. You can either put more particles in there or you can increase their speed by increasing the temperature. As you start using pressure in some of these gas law problems, one of the terms that you're going to come across is standard pressure. Standard pressure is pressure that's typically what you would expect to, to find around zero degrees sea level. So standard pressure is something that chemists have defined as like the normal pressure. And so there are different units on standard pressure, depending on whatever unit you need for your question. Standard pressure is all of these different values. Now I want to point out, these values are exactly the same, but they have different units. So standard pressure is one atmosphere, 101.3 kilopascals, 760 millimeters of mercury, or 760 torr. So those are just different values for standard pressure. The only difference between them is the unit. However, these can be used as conversion factors. So if you know these values for standard pressure, it makes it easier to help you convert between different pressure units. For example, if you were trying to convert from 0.894 atmospheres to Tor, then you would start with 0.894 atmospheres and then over here, remember, all of these values mean the same thing. The only thing that's different is the unit. So for every one atmosphere, there's 760 torr. I put the one atmosphere on the bottom so that it would cancel out. The 760 torr on the top, multiply across 0.894 atmospheres is 679 torr. I could convert that same value into kilopascals I would start the same way, start with what I'm given and the unit that I'm given. For every one atmosphere, there are 101.3 kilopascals. That gives me 90.6 as my final answer. So these values are important because they are your standard pressure units, but they're also handy conversion factors to help you convert pressure units. So at this point, we've seen temperature, and we've seen pressure, the next variable that affects gases is volume, the amount of space taken up by the substance, or the amount of space available for that gas. Volume is usually measured in milliliters, and some problems are going to give you some clues about volume. For example, if they say something like a rigid container, a rigid or a non-flexible container is one where the volume is going to remain constant. So um, your volume is going to be measured in liters or milliliters, and the terms like rigid mean that volume does not change. For variables that affect gases, we've seen temperature, pressure, volume, and the last variable is the number of particles. A gas is affected by the number of gas particles inside the container. This is going to be represented by the symbol N, and it is measured in moles. So just recall that a mole is a number, and just as a dozen means 12, a mole means 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. So if you were to see two moles, you've got two times this number, number of particles. So the number of particles is going to be measured in moles, and that is one of the things that's going to show up in these calculations that we're going to see. So now that we've defined gases and looked at the variables that are necessary for analyzing gases, I hope you'll stick around as we start to quantify that, as we start to look at some of the calculations that will help us figure some things out about gases. Mm -hmm.